Welcome everybody to today's virtual space hero LinkedIn Live. For the first time, it is a Monday at 6 p.m. CET. Well, as I announced a few weeks ago, we are experimenting a little bit with our live stream times and time zones. And therefore, well, we will check on that in 2021 and accordingly plan our live streams. We got so many messages over the past weeks that the Friday live stream, people like watching it afterwards. But for some of them, it was just hard to, to be there in the moment and really live, live, live on a Friday afternoon. So let's see. Today we can already welcome. Hello to Almendra connecting from Madrid, Spain. Hi there. And we also have Laura connecting already from Belgium. Hi there, Laura. Fantastic people, dear virtual space heroes. As you know, we are streaming to three platforms. Well, our main platform here is LinkedIn. We are streaming also on Facebook. And I do know there are also people always joining from YouTube. So please be so kind to let us know where you're joining from. From. And also don't miss to put all your questions, your comments and your thoughts into the chat box, into the, the comment function. So it would be fantastic if we co-design today's live session. Well, and this is already what today's topic is about. And I'm super happy to have with me an expert in the field of facilitation and virtual facilitation. And we are going to talk about designing for the online life experience. And you know, I define myself as a virtual enthusiast and I'm super happy that I found so many people this year, virtual facilitators joining me in my live show. We are discussing together and supporting you with ideas and new approaches on how to design for the life virtual experience. And with that, it is the moment to open our virtual space, your virtual doors in this case, <laughs> to Matthew Richter connecting from the United States, two hours in the north of New York. Hi there. Hey, Barbara. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much, Matthew. How are you doing? Good, and thanks for having me. And I see two of my friends are uh, watching today. So Laura that and Almendra. Fantastic. So <laughs> So hopefully we have more than them joining us as well, but if not, two of my favorite people in the world. Fantastic, fantastic. It's so beautiful, isn't it? Because we know that the, the world of intercultural um, enthusiasts or interculturalists is at the end, even though it's big, it is quite small at the end. And we see another interculturalist connecting, Anna Zelno, that you might also know as the previous president of Theater Spain. Indeed, Almendra is the current president. So, dear God, that's a presidential reunion, I would say. You know that's that right. I'm the past president of Sieta Austria? Well, you know my my partner, Tiagi, has been heavily involved in Sieta for the last 30 years. Tremendous. I know because we had him, and it was a great pleasure. We had him in the Sieta Europa Congress with a pre-Congress workshop in Valencia. And I was heading the communication and the academic committee. Well, he gets to go to all the good places. <laughs> Of course, of course. And we see more people connecting. So it is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I see also others who cannot now be there. But don't worry, don't worry. Um, this live stream is being recorded. So you find also the recording of the live stream later on if you click on the same link. But for those who are there, let us, of course, know your questions, your comments, your thoughts, so that we can, of course, answer also your um, to your questions in this case. So, Matthew, um, I know that you have been working for the Tiagi Group for many years. We have never met personally and we just recently indeed connected through uh, Melanie Martinelli from yeah. the learning gym who connected us yeah and she's been a friend of ours for for two decades as well and uh, I met Tiagi in 1994-95 and I joined the company uh, in 2003 wow and, um, and Tiagi and right now the company is the two of us 
So I'm the president, which makes me the lowest ranking person in the company. <laughs> and, uh, and he's our CEO, which makes him top dog. So. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, listen, but um, as a president of the Tiaki Group, so what is your focus when it comes to your um, to your learning activities and the whole Tiaki Group in general? Well, the the title is a joke. So, uh, but uh, from a day to day standpoint, both of us are focused on how to make learning more effective. Uh, more engaging, how to use interactive techniques strategically and, uh, and, and regardless of platform. So whether we are talking about in-person delivery or we're talking about live online or we're talking about asynchronous training, how can we make that more effective, more engaging and ultimately drive better learning transfer uh, onto the job or in whatever context you're talking about? Mm -hmm. So since when have you been designing virtual learning journeys? Because I know that you were super present also this year, but what is the previous experience that, um, that you have? Tiagi started uh, doing um, activity design for live online learning back in 2002 or 2003. And technically he was doing it way before that because he was doing activities using telephones and email. Um, but he started doing similar type things to what we're doing now uh, using what is now long obsolete technology. Uh, and in around 2005 and six, he started actually calling them Lola's live online learning activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so we've been doing that and selling um, uh, online training for, for almost two decades now. Fantastic. It's like Melanie. Melanie Martinelli is also involved in, in virtual yep. learning journeys for so many years. I must say, I just recently started doing that like seven years ago yeah. in academia. Awesome. And particularly, you know, I'm You're a brand new with this. Yeah, seven years old. Absolutely. <laughs> but I am curious now because you mentioned, and I'm not, I have no clue what Tiagi did. So, what did he do with the telephones? Ah, well, he would uh, come up with a whole bunch of different types of activities where people just simply be on the telephone. So they'd be uh, auditory activities. It wasn't an act. They weren't activities that leveraged the telephone in of itself. They were activities where a person would literally have their, their hand to their ear and he would run auditory activities. Um, mm -hmm. So an activity might be... Uh, uh, let's see if we he do a jolt, for example. A jolt is a short activity uh, where you can debrief it for, for a long time and then anchor the debrief to your training content. So he'd do a jolt where he'd have people on the phone uh, count to 10. But the trick is if two people simultaneously said the same number, we had to start over. So, for example, uh, you start with one, and then you can say two. But if I say two, we start over. So go ahead. Mm. Go ahead. Say one. You start. What? Okay. Now, if I say two, you could say two. Two. We both can try and say two as we try and get to 10. But if we simultaneously do it, we start all over. Does that make sense? Makes sense. All right. So go ahead. We'll do it. One. Two. Three. Four. Four. Oh, we got to start over. And mm. you do this a couple times because no one would ever get to 10, especially yeah. if you have a group of 15 people all on the phone. And then he would debrief that around what happened, what went wrong, why does this happen, what is this phenomenon, how do we come up with nonverbal agreements, how do we come up with nonverbal agreements when we can't see each other, how can we debrief this around distance and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these kinds of activities he would design on the f telephone because uh, someone said you can't do training on a phone. And so he would go around trying to prove them wrong. And I just love that because it reminds me a lot about what I was talking to Melanie as well, when she had to set up, I think, a learning journey. I think it was Pakistan, the last project that she mentioned when we were talking. And of course, there were not all the possibilities on setting up, on using Zoom, using even the video that is already like sort of uh, like the maximum, right? And I know myself, I'm teaching a lot in Azerbaijan and also Pakistan. Yeah. And I know that my students cannot even be on video. So how do you create interaction or even just this belonging? 
Well, I think it's, uh, it's, a huge, it's a huge mistake to think you uh, can't just rely on the chat. So if we, we could design training where people are just on audio and just using the chat, to, hey, people are able to con comment, right? Uh, people can comment like a chat. Is that correct, yeah. Barbara? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so we could have people um, uh, um, contribute to an activity via the chat and reflect on it. So, for example, we could say, hey, I just ran a jolt, folks. Let's do a debrief. What is one uh, thing you took away from the jolt I just ran with Barbara? And by the way, I didn't really run it. So if you don't come up with anything, don't feel bad. <laughs> but if you type into the chat something you took away from that piece, blah, 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 now we're getting people to engage in the chat. And yeah. so we designed some of the activities around the lowest technical denominator, so, right? So if people can only chat, let's build all our activities around the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I love using the video and the audio because there's so many things we can do in terms of watching body language, in terms of watching uh, each other. We can do role playing. So there are all sorts of things we can do with video and audio. But if I can't have that, then I can modify and, and do things in the chat. I can modify and do things just on audio and so forth. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So. And it's fun because, you know, Almendra is really picking up on that because she's saying, yeah, that we should talk or that we talk over each other and don't listen as much as we should. Exactly. And clearly the moment that we have the video on, it's also something that we um, <clears throat> sort of influences us, right? Well, this is an interesting thing. I find we talk over each other more in person or we ignore each other more in person. But when people are online uh, uh, on Zoom, you can't hear anything if people talk over each other. Mm -hmm. So people stop quickly. And there's informal rules that form. And I, I rarely find the excitement gets so high that, that people are rude and cut each other off. In fact, I find that the inverse happens online. And I'm actually finding more and more people are able to focus uh, intently online in ways that they may not do so uh, in person. That's interesting because I would say that I've heard particularly this year exactly the opposite that can also be true like the moment that we are online it is difficult because the interaction that I'm having for example being present with you here exactly but so why, all do my we do that? why do we go to our phone because you're not as interesting as my phone not you are super interesting I'm using you generically but <laughs> The reason we go to our phones is because we think what's on our phone is more important than what we're doing now. Or the reason we go to our phone is we're bored. Well, why does that happen? Because your training isn't relevant or your training isn't engaging. In other words, you're not doing activities. Mm -hmm. So build activities, design your training around the activities and you won't have people going to their phones. Mm -hmm. Design your training so it's relevant and not stupid right? Don't have people make funny, silly sounds just as a, an icebreaker. I hate icebreakers, by the way, <laughs> uh, because they're irrelevant and they have nothing to do with actual relevant learning. Mm. That's why I personally, I personally believe that icebreakers, if they are well connected or to the topic, and I, for example, I like icebreakers because if they are well connected to the topic, or I sometimes use icebreakers to introduce technology. But now you're not talking about an icebreaker. You're talking about a good opening activity. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Good point. Right? Icebreakers, by definition, are about breaking the ice. They're not about introducing content or introducing a theme or teaching people a particular thing. Icebreakers tend to traditionally be uh, silly things that are to uh, warm us up. Well, if it's relevant, you don't have to warm us up or you can warm us up the way you just described, which are brilliant approaches. Mm -hmm. Those are phenomenal approaches to getting people mm -hmm. engaged early. And you can call it whatever you want. The approach is what I care about. So what mm -hmm. you're doing is brilliant. Thumbs up. 
So let's talk about that. So um, yeah. because we talked today about designing the live online experience. So we talked about how do you start a training? Mm -hmm. It's let's call it maybe not an icebreaker. It's the opening that should be relevant. It should be strong. Or what would you would we what would you suggest? Well, everything go should be relevant. Product? Everything you do should be relevant or don't do it. Uh, but the first thing I always like to do is ask myself, what are we doing? Before I deliver a training, I ask myself, what are my objectives? Why am I building a course? Why am I going to deliver a course? In other words, what do I want people to do differently as a result of this training? Then I design a performance test, some proof that they're going to do what they're supposed to do differently. Mm -hmm. And then I build backwards, right? So we teach then to the test. So um, hey, can someone put in the chat a topic, any topic? First person that puts a topic, that's the topic we'll focus on. Um, before I turn 50. <laughs> Let's give them a few seconds. You know, live stream oh, is latency. always like three yeah. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so, One topic, people out there. Go ahead. Could be anything. Could be basket weaving. <laughs> we already talked about that, Matthew. Yeah, we that's right. Before we started. Basket weaving now. <laughs> so. But let's say, well, we're waiting for a topic. Let's say the topic is on listening skills. What do we want people to listen better doing, right? Ah, change management. I love change management. Fantastic. Nina, so you got it. Management is great. So what do we mean by this nebulous, vague topic of change management? What do we want our participants to do differently as a result of change management? Well, there could be many things. Maybe we're dealing with a group, a cohort who don't have a lot of authority or a lot of autonomy. And so what we need is to train them how to cope with that lack of autonomy. Maybe they're managers and they have more authority than they think. And so we're going to build uh, skills around how they can manage this even when they don't set the change. Maybe they're the, the leaders and they have to uh, come up with changes that are going to help them be more effective in implementing a strategic plan. Whichever we go with, we start there, get the answer, and now we build a test. And I like using scenarios and simulations to build that test. So let's say we're, we're going to do change management and we're working with people uh, who are in management, but don't they're, they're mid-level managers. So we take a group of mid-level managers and some of the scenarios we come up with have to do with you're, you're, you have an employee who's very stressed out and becoming less productive. So that's the scenario. What tools are you going to employ that you've learned in this training to help facilitate that person to better productivity as a result? Okay, that's one scenario. Here's another scenario. How do you communicate this change in a way where it's received positively rather than instilling fear? Okay, let's make people through that scenario deliver that message, construct it and deliver it and so forth. And we can come up with 10 to 15 different scenarios that these managers are going to have to uh, manage. And we create then a toolkit to help participants solve those challenges. A toolkit might include a rubric uh, for evaluating how they do it. It might include a process. It might include a checklist and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now we create activities to teach people how to engage with the tools to solve the problems that'll be in that performance test. So let's do an opening activity. Let's do a structured sharing activity where we gather information from the participants. This will be our opening activity. And what we're doing is we're essentially conducting a needs analysis through this activity. So we can learn where our participants fall relative to what our objectives are. Mm -hmm. And so we will ask them questions about scenarios that make them nervous about the upcoming change. We might ask the question about what they understand the change is. We might ask them uh, about uh, some of the skills associated with the change and how they might approach it and so forth. And we have a game frame for doing that. So it's highly interactive. We can do it on Zoom. We can do it on WebEx. We can do it asynchronously and we can do it in person. And so we kick off with that and then move on progressing through the training agenda. I don't know if that made sense. 
made a lot of sense made a lot of sense and we are already getting a few comments here so also picking up on the icebreaker discussion we have maybe we're going to do that dive into that for one second again so sure. also tomorrow is saying is saying i'm not a fan of icebreakers Good. overrated don't foster an inclusive culture and um there is also amanda saying that she agrees icebreaking just for that purpose it it's not something i do it has to be connected exactly and oh. that's also what we discussed before right and yeah. anna confirms it it's a good idea to use an icebreaker or an opener i think you refer to it as an opener right matthew if you want yeah. to introduce the topic you call it whatever you want but the idea here is is whatever you do to kick off your training should be pertinent to the topic either act as a needs analysis or act as a way of introducing material it should be uh, it should be intentionally valuable, it should have relevance to the learners. Otherwise, don't do it. Absolutely. And I think still, whether we call it icebreaker or opener, um, I think an opener also can break the ice, to say so. And <laughs> exactly. I think, as I said, the, the icebreaker or the opener can be related to the topic, to a needs analysis, or even, as I really also like to use it, is to introduce different elements of the platform. Right. Because sometimes, even though people are familiar with Zoom nowadays, there are still many, many people who are not familiar with such a small thing as the annotation tool. And if I want to use that and I like to use it, I use an activity <clears throat> building upon the technology <throat> somehow as well. Exactly, exactly. And and again, you know, Tiagi likes Tiagi hates annotation. And and he yep, he hates it. And I keep saying, why do you hate it? Why do you hate it? And and his answer is because there's always two people that can't figure it out. <laughs> and and including him. And, and he's, he's right to a degree, because if you have two or three people who are really struggling, you either lose time catching them up or you, they never get it. And in which case, then you have two people who are disenfranchised throughout the, the activity or it works, but maybe there was a more efficient way for us to do it. Mm -hmm. So annotation is fun because it looks good and it gives you something to save. But is it really the best tool we can use if we have a group of people that may struggle with it? Mm -hmm. Or if I have 50 people in the room and we're running a program with 50 people, then annotation can get very overwhelming because the screen is <laughs> they have to have yourself about the appropriateness. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it reminds me of a discussion that I had still um, because I think annotation and people who cannot join the annotation or didn't don't figure it out. And even though I explained it like three times, they, I just ask them to use the chat and then I put it on yeah. the uh, on the board. But exactly. I think what is very nice and that's uh, I'm, I'm citing I'm quoting now Cassie Labori mm -hmm. and Cassie Labori said um, that we sometimes hold the bar too low for our learners. So also if I have a longer program, I do I make them go through all these things because I use them extensively so they need to figure that out in the first in the second and but maybe in the third everybody's on board and everybody is quick and fast when I want to do a polling give me a green check everybody has a green check in 10 seconds in the first training it takes me probably like four minutes <laughs> well so I'm gonna agree with Cassie with a caveat so if I'm never gonna see these people again then I still may choose to go at the lowest denominator. If I'm running a shorter program versus a longer program, I'll choose to go to the lowest denominator. If the activity could be done more efficiently in a different way, then I'll go to the lowest denominator technologically. Again, when I say lowest denominator, I'm not referring to people, I'm referring to the tech. And so from an instructional design standpoint, the tech should never be my priority. And that's not what Cassie's saying. I know it. Ca I, I know Cassie, and that's not her intent. But I want to be clear that instructionally, our goal should never be the tech. The technology should be flawlessly behind the scenes so that our participants have an experience where they don't even know they're on tech. Mm -hmm. And we leverage the technology to advance our objectives, not for the sake of, of cool features, but for the sake of reaching our our objectives in solving business problems or community problems or whatever we're there for. So technology should never be the goal. Absolutely. And 
which I, again, I, I know Kathy would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question now. So let's go with the lowest denominator and let's call it the Zoom chat in that case. So if you if you agree with that, um, the Zoom chat or maybe the, the well, reaction. I missed the, the Zoom what case? The chat, the chat. Okay. If we go with the chat function in a tool, that's mm -hmm. probably, at least from my experience, that the lowest denominator for everybody. Actually, the lowest denominator is usually the audio. Is the audio. Good point. Good point. Right. And, and so a lot of activities, we don't even need chat. We can just run it here and have people use pen and paper. The lowest denominator actually is a piece of paper and a pen. And we can use that still on Zoom. Right. So I don't mean to interrupt that. Sorry. No, no, no. You're totally right. I'm just saying that most of the times I fall out of that category because I'm 99% digital. So I always struggle when somebody asks me for paper. <laughs> 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 Let's go for the chat now. Uh, just because I want okay. to go for the chat now, please. Okay. <laughs> um, if we think about the chat, so we're designing for the live online um, event, the interaction. Could you give us maybe a few examples on how you would be using the chat throughout the training to create interaction? Sure. Um, uh, let's see. Do people have the ability to see us still? Yes. So we're on camera. We're on camera. Okay. Hey, my friends Laura and Almendra have seen this, so they, they get to they get to see an activity twice. I'm going to do a magic trick with you, okay? So I'm holding up two cards. What's this card? Oops, I'm reversed. So what's this card? This is the queen. The queen. Very good. Good. Do you know what this card is? Uh, no. Okay. Hey, folks, that's because I didn't show her. But do me a favor, you guys be ready. You're going to participate in the chat in a second. So it's a, oops, a two of spades. Two of spades, okay. yeah. So if I take... Almendra is already saying she loves this one. Wait, wait, course. wait. She's my favorite person. <laughs> so I take the two of spades, I put it behind my head. What's this card? The queen. No, the queen is behind my head. I want you to stick with me, Barbara. Okay, <laughs> what's this card? To God, Matthew, huh? the two of spades. No, the two of spades is behind my head. Okay, good. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know this trick, anyone have an idea how it's done? I know Laura and Almendra know. But if anyone <laughs> has an idea how it's done, go ahead. If you don't know, it's okay, too. Now, people help me out putting people this out in the there. chat. Almendra, Laura, help me out there. Let me know what happens here, please. Now, and they can, they put this in the chat. So now we're integrating chat, right? Because they cannot easily turn on their microphones. Okay, so far no one has chatted, but that's okay. What I will do is I'm going to show you that this is a simple trick. You assume that this card, right? has what on the other side? The two. No, this the two is on this side. Uh, and this card has two backs. Mm. So two fronts here, two backs here. Not an illusion, not three cards, as Michael said. <laughs> an illusion, no. <laughs> now it's you see we're trying to get stuff in chat. <laughs> now, for those of you watching, why would I, might I introduce a magic trick like this and have you uh, in, in front of a change management workshop? Why might we introduce a change management workshop with this silly magic trick where the two fronts and two backs? Anyone know? Now you'll notice that one of the tricks with chat is it takes time for people to type. So one of the downsides of leveraging chat is people are typing. So one LinkedIn user says old fashioned cheating. We could use that and talk about never trust your trainer. So that's certainly one thing we could use as a, an, as a debrief point. But LinkedIn users talking about assumptions we make and how hardwired these assumptions are if you are familiar with playing cards, as Almandra said, when we make assumptions, we look at things one way, 
But as Almandra is talking about, if we can break the mold and start thinking about them differently, changing our expectations, we can see solutions to other problems. In other words, we're so hardwired to think there's a front and a back mm -hmm. that we refuse to see other possibilities. What assumptions are we carrying about the change that's coming that we're all here in this change management workshop about that we don't even know our assumptions? Now we have an anchoring metaphor and we use the chat to do it. Absolutely. And I think Nina, let us know, what do you think about this activity for your change management course? Because I think you already start very soon, right? So let us know your, <laughs> your points on that. I loved it. It's really very nice. We just had um, a, a tremendous experience with Tobias Grunfelder. Yeah. He's a PhD student. You know him? I know of Tobias. Ah, he's amazing. And yes. he was just the one keynote speaker that, well, left me like with an open mouth and loving like yeah. crazy because the way he connected magic and played with illusion. And he was also only possible to use chat for the comments, but yeah. he could see our faces. So it was slightly different in terms of interaction. Exactly, exactly. And so I can leverage a chat and I can make activities all chat-based, right? I could give a story and ask people to finish it and have people type into it. I could have people think through and answer questions. Uh, I could ask people to create using the chat quiz questions that I then flip back and ask people to answer and they use the chat. Mm -hmm. First person say one gets to answer it and then they can answer it. And if they mm -hmm. get it, they get a point. So there are lots and lots of ways we can leverage the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and we could also just have everyone's mic turned on and have people just talk. And Absolutely. there are lots of ways we can engage. You know, everyone uses, um, th there's a big push now to call this kind of training a VILT, a virtual instructor-led training. I hate this. This really offends me. It really doesn't but I'm trying to show passion, but <laughs> it really offends Why? me. Why? Wait, let, let, let me answer with passion. Why, Matthew? <laughs> because this is real. The word virtual implies a facsimile. It implies something that's false. It implies something that's, that's, that's not quite as good as the original. It's, it's not real. The word that's virtual. presence. Well, why do, why do you feel that? I know. Not that. in Brussels? Well, I don't know about Brussels. I mean, Brussels, it's all about beer, right? <laughs> so, but everywhere else, in English at least, the word virtual has all these definitions and associations with it. If you look in the dictionary, virtual, it means facsimile. It means faux. It means a, a not quite as good copy. And that was true five years ago. I couldn't deliver in-person training, right? Uh, I couldn't deliver live online training like this as well as I could in person. Mm. But today I can. In fact, there's studies. Will Talheimer has a wonderful um, meta-analysis review of different qualities around e-learning and which e-learnings are better significantly or insignificantly compared to in-person training. By the way, are we face-to-face? -face? We use the phrase face-to-face -to, -face to refer to in-person training, but we're you and I are face-to-face -face now, and mm -hmm. if you just let these poor folks get on their camera, they'd be face-to-face -to -face too. So face -to -face if I could to technologically, I would, like, I would invite everybody on the stage now. All right, but but these are, these are the things we use to distinguish. Why does it matter? It matters because when we use language, we, Im, Im, we impugn a meaning to the things we're talking about. And if we imply things are, are not as good as the original in person, mm. then our participants are going to have that kind of feeling. Our participants are going to view live online training as not as good. Well, that's not showing to be the case. We're finding that live online training can be as good if if and only if the instructional design is good. 
Absolutely. And right. you know, this also reminds me a lot about the discussions that I had this year, for example, also with Kathy or with Joshua Davis, um, also with Melanie, of course, that we were facing quite some struggles this year to really transform and not just convert as everybody was thrown from one day to another into the virtual space. That's also a little bit where the, the bad taste of virtual training comes from because there was too much conversion and not enough. Well, there was too much going. bad crap out there. I mean, yeah. a lot of people, I was shocked. I would meet people who were offering themselves as uh, online uh, facilitators, experts in online delivery. How many times have you done it? Once. But they were experts. Mm. And, you know, uh, there was a lot of bad stuff going on in the, the early parts of the, the pandemic. Um, but, uh, you know. There are, there are good people out there who have been doing this a long time, Cassie being one of them, Melanie being another. And I would I know both of them use the word vilt, but both of them don't deliver facsimiles. They deliver great stuff, mm. right? Absolutely. And, uh, so you got to be careful. There's a lot of reasons why people have a bad taste about all this. Zoom fatigue, for example. Um Hey, Laura, Laura sat through multiple days of training with me. And um, Laura, how, how would you uh, rate your, your full day trainings with us? Did you experience a lot of fatigue? I hope she says no. <laughs> Laura, we're waiting for your answer now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Almandra has also sat through it with us as well. Yeah. yeah hey, yeah. Almandra, stop using virtual. <laughs> well, I, I was do, really just, there. I, do, uh, I call I, I call my company Virtual Space Hero. No, it sticks. I think it's a lot about perception as well, and we are believers. And I'm still. I must say that I don't have that bad taste as you have that. But I totally I agree with what you're saying. But I don't have. Maybe it's also because I'm not an English native speaker. Yeah. That I don't have that connotation. I don't feel it as negatively. Well, but it's sort of semiotics, right? I mean the. There's the the meaning behind words and language and the signs around us. It was fine. That's that's by the way, French <laughs> Belgian for it was awesome. So. <laughs> it was fine. Wait, wait, wait. It was fine. Really fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's the French way of saying it was fantastic. <laughs> so. Matthew, um, let me just ask you another question. So we were talking about designing and we were talking about the process that you're going through when you're designing for the live online experience. We were talking about how to use chat and we had that beautiful um, experiment here also online on how to engage people. And for all of you out there, you know, for us, it's pretty hard because we cannot see you. So we totally rely on the chat and the comments and on your questions. So that's also really an, an important aspect. Talk about interaction because that's also something that was hugely discussed and debated this year on how to engage and foster interaction. What are other tools or um, methods that you're using, Matthew? Well, we, we have, um, Tiagi's come up with, I think, 66 different uh, interactive approaches. And then within each of those categories, uh, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of activities. So activities are a great way to engage. Now, what does that mean? It can mean games. It could mean doing simulations. It could mean uh, different types of activities where you get people talking, role playing, etc. So, hey, Anna, now I want to go to the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so, virtual is not physically existing as such, but made by software to appear to do so. That's not the dictionary definition I see from the OED. So, but I will share mine later with you. So, <laughs> We are waiting for that. But, but Anna actually is uh, actually has incredible background, and so I will defer to her and and uh, co-opt uh, admit that I may be wrong. <laughs> so, um, but there are tons and tons of ways to engage people through activities. But here's another way: relevance is often diminished in the way people view things. So the more relevant you are to what people deal with day to day, the more people are going to find um, uh, 
uh, a rationale for being there and be engaged. Mm -hmm. um, activity and engagement is not making people do stuff. It's making people want to use their brains to think and to ponder, to consider. A good way to do that is physically getting them active. But there are many ways to get people active, including uh, thought experiments. Uh, a favorite one of Tiagi's is Green Monkey. Um, hey, folks, I'm going to ask you to take uh, one minute, one minute only, and I want you to think about anything you want, but whatever you do, do not think about green monkeys. Do not think about green monkeys. <laughs> and so we're not going to do it because I know you only have one more minute left. But uh, if we were to do this, most people struggle uh, not thinking about green monkeys. And we can debrief that and turn that into a whole thought experiment. And so no one's moving, no one's typing, no one's doing anything, no one's even talking until we debrief. Yet that's a highly immersive activity. Mm. So engagement is in the brain. It's, it's not in the mouse. It's not in the hands. It's not in the feet. It's getting people active here. You know what I, uh, I'm just thinking about also a conversation that I had this year and it was about silence in the virtual space because the moment that you give people more time to think, to reflect and whether they are thinking now, because everybody has now the green monkey in the head, right? And we need to debrief that now. Matthew, we cannot leave without debriefing that. I'm happy but to do that. We need to do that. We need to do that. Otherwise, how will I sleep tonight? Impossible. <laughs> but I think the point of... Um, um, as you were saying, like using the brains and giving them a good question to reflect or think about is super, super powerful. And I talked with that a little bit about um, with Isman Tanuri, for example, as well. We talked about silence and um, on how it is underused in the virtual space. And particularly me, I must say, totally um, horrible because I cannot stand silence. So the moment that I'm in too much silence, uh, too many seconds of silence, I immediately continue talking as well because that's my way of, um, well, breaking the, the silence, right? That's right. That's right. Hey, can I, uh, can I change the subject quickly? Go ahead. I wanted to say how right Anna was. So... While we were talking, I multitasked and I looked up virtual. And Anna is dead on. I am wrong about my complaint about the word virtual. And so I want to give Anna ah. applause and uh, and uh, just say, uh, yep, Oxford says it, and um, I'm wrong. Oxford and Matthew says it. So no, no, no. I only repeat Oxford. Europe out there <laughs> much space for people out there let's be happy now yeah go ahead use it if you want so but cheers to to anna so let's go with the silence what do we do do you see that two seconds of silence on your side and i'm already like so let's come back to the topic okay okay you want to remind me what about silence and what about the, the brain activity that you were saying, like reflection and the green monkey? What's what's happening with the green monkey? Help so, us. Don't be afraid of silence. Silence uh, is not so silent in people's brains. But if you don't fill the space with something for them to do or think about, then you're going to have them fill that silence with their grocery lists or something probably we don't want to know about. Uh, so there are all sorts of ways in which we can leverage silence to get people to reflect, to think. In lots of activities, you can use silence to build space, to get people to slow down. Slowing down is a great way to get people to ponder and consider things. So you don't always have to go at breakneck speeds. Uh, mm -hmm. Take a minute, give people a few seconds of silence. Don't be afraid of, of stopping in an online session and saying, Barbara, what do you think about this? Now, she doesn't fill the space, folks. Keep quiet. Let her think. It's okay. And even in that discomfort of her silence, she'll actually fill it eventually. So be comfortable with the silence that's online. It's, it's good. Uh, just make sure that it's, again, relevant, and you are intentionally filling that silence with something for folks to think about. Mm, mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really liked, uh, but I'm still stuck with the green monkey. Come on, Matthew, help hey. me out. Well, in terms of 
what to do with yeah how do, I get, how do how do i get it out of my hand who, who's my psychologist friend in who, who's here again who has is was it anna who has the the who's the psychologist i don't know indeed okay well in psychology there's a wonderful psychologist named bluma zagarnik and bluma did a whole bunch of research on should we uh resolve ideas and concepts and she did a wonderful, very famous set of experiments at cafes, I think in Vienna or somewhere in Switzerland. Um, and where she started to note that uh, waiters would ask uh, their customers what they wanted. Then the waiter would bring it back perfectly. And then, and she was amazed. Some of these orders were huge and long. And then, she, so she would go up to them well after they the customers had left and ask if she they remembered the order. And of course, they wouldn't. And what she realized was that these folks were not only uh, remembering finitely; they would remember to the point where there was closure, and then they forget it all. And so, the Zagarnik effect is the notion that as long as there's no closure we will still keep pondering, considering, <laughs> reflecting. And so I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> Till, the next time. Till the next time. So 2021, I'll see if I have a slot in March or April, and uh, you're going to be back here, okay. April, Matthew. Okay. <laughs> and all of you out there, so no excuses. We're going to have him back. Impossible. <laughs> I'll be um, an <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so... Let me ask you a, a final question, and um, that is about closing. How do you design for the closure of the virtual life or the yeah. online life experience? Well, again, it depends on your objective, but what we like to do is, is not actually close. The training workshop itself is not um, uh, a closing point. What are you going to do to take this back and apply that? So. Some people call it action planning. Some call, people call it uh, application planning, whatever you want to call it. I like to get people to think about what they're going to do um, and bring it back into the flow of their work. So how are you going to apply this? And there are a ton of activities we can do. Uh, if you go onto our website, you can search for closing activities, and we have a bunch of them. Uh, and we're, Or just send me an email, and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Uh, but closing activities should always focus on next steps. Exactly. And I think with that, it's also beautiful because we do know that also this conversation is, is conversation is not closed here because we are following up with you on the comments. We are posting the link to the Tiagi Group's um, webpage and showing you where you find all these detailed information also there. And um, with that, I must say, Matthew, thank you, thank you so much for being with me here. I loved it, and I don't want to close it now. <laughs> I, I continue, of course, following you and um, oh, looking at the workshops and also at your webpage with all the tremendous offer that you're having out there. And we're posting that also for all of you. And those of you, even though I think most of most of our visitors, participants um, today already connected with you, those who have not yet, go up to the description of this live stream. You find Matthew being Tag there and definitely connect with him. With him. So it would be wonderful. Anna, please, please connect. So that would be great. And anyone else, I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I live on LinkedIn and uh, it would be an honor. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And with that, well, um, I told you that I have sort of a virtual online you, cocktail you prepared you behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm kicking you out, but I'm coming to you backstage in a second. <laughs> no worries. Take care, Thank everyone. You much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Matthew. Bye. Bye. Well, with that, thank you so much, everybody, for being with us today at this virtual space here on LinkedIn Live. And, well, I just want to thank you for all your comments, for your ideas, for sharing um, in the chat and through the comment function your experience. Next week, there is the last LinkedIn Live for this the year coming up. And next week, we're going to talk about visualization in an online, in a virtual context. And I'm super happy I have with me Tim Hansen connecting from Singapore. I attended one of his workshops and I always thought I'm a terrible 
well, painter, not really, but drawer, whatever, a visual artist. And throughout this one hour training, I was able to really draw some nice visuals that I was able to use in my um, in my trainings, in my keynotes as well, with a second camera connecting. It's very powerful. It's very visual, haha. And I'm sure we're going to have an exciting conversation. So I really hope to see you um, all also next week. Next week, we're changing the time and it's going to be on the 30th of December and we're going live at 10 a.m. Thank you very much for being with us. Virtual Space Heroes, have a beautiful Monday and I see you very soon. Let's become a Virtual Space Hero. Bye.